Thank you for making me part of this today. It's uh, really exciting and giving me the chance today to talk about Cliff Bar and Company and share our history and story uh, with you. Um, you know, these, I gave this spe uh, talk similar to this a couple weeks ago at Kellogg, and it's really exciting that these, these types of dialogues and conversations on sustainability are happening at a much more uh, rapid pace, and they need to, whether it's in college campus campuses public, uh, public uh, forums, or just in business. They need to continue at that rate if we're going to get ahead of the challenges that face us today as a, as a, uh, as a people and as a, as a human race. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about Cliff Bar and Company. It's my second favorite topic. My first one's my family. We have got um, three little boys, my wife and I. They are twins two and a half and a, and a boy nine months. And I started when I was 30. No, I'm kidding. No, I started a little later. But um, no, we are, and we are really in it right now. And I mean, both figuratively and literally, we are in it. But anyway, today I get to talk about Cliff Bar and Company, which is a, a, a close second. So I want to give you some of the challenges and opportunities of running a privately held, employee-owned, socially responsible business. And we're going to talk through some of the, the journey that we've been on, give you a little bit of the history of the company. It's a fun it's an interesting, fascinating, fun history. And then also talk to you about um, some of the uh, challenges and opportunities we've had as we've scaled our sustainability efforts as an organization. So to start with, um, when I, just to give you a little bit of a backdrop, I'm, when I talk about social change today, in a very easy way to understand it when we talk about it is that people, health, and planet health is our focus. So people, health, and planet health is our focus. And when we think about people and, and we think about our business and people and planet health being the focus, business is really a means for us to drive towards that end. And that's how we think about it as the organization. And, you know, when I talk about social change, there's a few areas. One is organic agriculture and organic farming. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Another one is the climate change. And the last one is our business model and how we think about running our business in a different way. So first, on organic, how many people are familiar with organic farming? Everyone, yes. And the benefits of organic farming are, uh, are significant. And you know, there's no use of chemical fertilizers or toxic pesticides in the actual farming practices. And I failed at a joke when I was at Kellogg giving the speech a few weeks ago, so I won't pain you with the same, or pain myself with the same failure today. But my point was just, if I'm going to add pesticides, toxic pesticides, or chemical fertilizers, let me do that. I don't need, the, I don't need the, anyone else doing that for me. Because I'd like to know actually what's being added in that process. Um, OK, a little better result on the laugh today. So that's, <laughs> that's encouraging and good. Um, but no, and there's a lot of benefits to organic farming. You know, there are more nutrients and more antioxidants in the food. There's better farmer um, and, you know, health for farmers, whether it's farm workers or farm families, because there's, there's no exposure to the chemicals or fertilizers. And that's a, that's a really big deal for us as an organization as we think about growing our, growing our role there. So organic agriculture plays a big role for us. The other is climate change. So clearly it's the number one environmental issue facing us today. And we have a lot of efforts at the company geared towards reducing in, uh, our impacts as an organization and as a company. And then lastly is our business model that Steve alluded to a little bit, which is really running our business not just based on one bottom line, but ba a financial, financially driven one but really based on five bottom lines. I'm going to make the case here in a little bit that, um, that has really been key both to our success financially as well as to our success as an organization culturally as well as just as a company as, at whole. So we're, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. So there are actually three key takeaways I would like you to take away from today's meeting. And this is all about how do you really scale both uh, scale a sustainability effort. And there's three areas I'd like you to take away. One, you got to put it in employees' hands. It's critical that employees own a social message. And as you start driving social change, that employees own it and buy in and actually create most of the program. We're going to talk about some of the successes we've had as a company um, that have come from the teams that actually do the work day in and day out. The second one is integration, which I just talked about. 
which is really about integrating it into your business model. It has to become part of just how you do business. And it has to have, meaning the planet and the, uh, and the community, have to have a seat at the table when we're talking about these decisions as we run a business. So putting it in people's hands and integrating into every, everyday decisions at your company. And then lastly, is just enga fully engaging in external markets. Partners, other businesses, NGOs, um, everyone in that space is grabbing and fully engaging in that dialogue and conversation and becoming a part of that conversation. So we're going to talk a little bit here about Cliff Bar and Company and give you a little bit of a background. So how many of you here before you saw the presentation had heard of Cliff Bar and Company? Okay, very good. We're doing our job. Um, how many of you have had a Cliff Bar before maybe that one today? All right. All right, we got a good group. So as Steve said, we are a maker of healthy snacking for athletes made from natural and organic ingredients and formulas. So here are a list of our products. And we break them out into a couple different areas. Over there you have athletes for, uh, uh, products for athletes and active lifestyle. So you have the Cliff Bar that you all have in front of you. You have our Builders Bar. Um, you have our ath athletic bars over here. Our, our athletic products being the Shot Drink, our Blocks, um, Shot Gel, Shot Rocks. In the middle, products targeted toward women. You see Luna Bar and Luna Protein, uh, which is uh, the first protein bar specifically designed for women. And actually, the Luna Bar was the first women's bar back in 1999, specifically targeted towards women's nutrition needs. And then you have Kids, our kids product, uh, Cliff Kid Twisted Fruit, as well as our Z Bar organic product, um, which were in Z Bar organic bar was introduced in 2004. And then we have a healthy snacking, which are Mojo, our Mojo products, our Mojo dips, which are sweet and salty snacks as well as um, our Cliff C, which is our uh, fruit and nut bar, and then our Cliff Crunch. Anybody had Cliff Crunch down here yet? What'd you think? Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> Beats Nature Valley, hands down. That's what I wanted to hear. Yes, 70% organic, and we believe, and we're hearing better tasting from everybody except you. <laughs> Just kidding. No, so, you know, so these, these are our products. And this, this all started back in 1990. Gary Erickson, owner, founder of the company, started in 1990 uh, on a bike ride, 175-mile bike ride. He's out with his buddy. And this was a one-day trip. He was, uh, had $1,000 to his name, um, was living in a friend's garage, um, and, he, uh, and he was on this bike ride. And he'd had four of the competitive product, the only bar, other bar out there at that time in the marketplace, which was... Power bar. Um, the only other product, he had four of them, went for his fifth one and said, there's no way I can do a fifth bar. <laughs> and as he was riding home, he said, you know what? He was a baker by trade, had a storefront bakery at the time, said, I think I can make a better product that's all natural and make a better product for, um, for consumers, something that people would want to eat, whether on a bike or whether snacking that they'd <laughs> want to eat. Because I know I was doing triathlons back in the early 90s, and I understood his pain um, of that. But that was, the, that was the genesis of the idea. So the, the company was really born, we all often say, on a bike and born in the outdoors. And so he came home and worked for the next two years with his mom in the kitchen, developing what is now known as the Cliff Bar. And he launched it in 1992, named it after his dad, who was Clifford, Cliff, named it after his dad, who was an avid outdoorsman, who had, who had really ins, um, uh, instilled in Gary the, the, uh, the outdoors, whether it was climbing or hiking or skiing or, or riding his bike, was he really grew up in the outdoors, and this was a key component to him and his, him and his life and how he, how he grew up. So he named the product after his dad, Cliff. So the company, as you can see, really started to grow over the next, and these things happened over, over the last 20 years, but over those first 10 years, the company had rapid growth. The first year in 92 did 700,000 in sales, and in 1999 did just short of 40 million. So really expansive growth. And in 1999, the Luna Bar was, was launched, which was another big addition, which again was the bar targeted toward women, to the company. So you're sitting there in 2000, 
and some things start to shift. So we had two major competitors at the time. There was Power Bar and there was Balance Bar. But things started to shift as, a, as the industry started to shift because Kraft came in, everybody knows Kraft, came in, you know, $25, $30 billion company and bought Balance Bar. And then Nestle, slightly larger company, came in and bought Power Bar. So conventional wisdom was, big guys come into a market like this, they're going to dominate. What's Cliff Bar got to do? Cliff Bar has to sell. So Gary started going down this process with his partner at the time to sell the company. He had an offer in 2000, 2001 for $120 million for Cliff Bar. Yeah, pretty big numbers. And at the time, he had this, this offer. He thought long and hard about it because the, the conventional wisdom, as I said, so there's no way you can compete against these big guys when they come into a market. So we have to figure out, so we have to sell. Went through the whole process, got to the day of signing and said, there's just no way I can do this. This is personal to me. This is about my family. This is about a legacy. This is about, it clearly isn't about making money for me because this is about much, things much more important than that. Um, and we'll talk about what those things are uh, in here in just a minute. But he really went down this path of, of soul searching and saying, what's the company, what's the business about? And, you know, he walked away from $120 million. Now, his partner, who was a 50% owner, wasn't so happy about walking away from $120 million, <laughs> who didn't have maybe the same connection to it. So he ended up not only walking away from his share of the $120 million, but also from taking on a mountain of debt to buying her out. So huge risk. Right? And, a, and a really gutsy move. And without, an, without a clear future, really, except for a commitment to running a different kind of business and to doing things from the heart. And so in 2000, 2001, Gary did a lot of soul searching and said, you know, this business just isn't clearly about one bottom line being the financial one. Because if it was, he would have sold the company. It was really about five bottom lines. And what you see here is a wheel. And this, anybody, any cyclists in here? Yeah, I got a few cyclists. And what, these are spokes. And what we're trying to portray here is that each one of these spokes is critical and has to have the similar amount of tension on them for the tire to remain straight and to roll correctly. So what we have here is these are our five bottom lines or our five aspirations. So it's sustaining our people, sustaining our communities that we do business in, sustaining our planet, sustaining our business, and sustaining our brands. So my job at Cliff Bar & Company is really to do just this. It's not just to focus on the business and saying, how do we return the best financial value? It's actually about managing all five of these things in concert with one another. And, you know, what, what he, um, and this, is, this was, you know, in 2001, this was an experiment. He said, it's not about this. I want to run a different kind of company. And at the end of the day, our mission of the company is to run a different kind of company. And also a part of that mission is to try to get other companies and other organizations to do similar things, to run a different kind of business. Because we understand at the end of the day, being the company we are and the size we are, that our efforts in the grand scheme of things are a little bit of a drop in the bucket. But if we can influence other organizations and other companies, wow, think about the impact that we can have as an organization and as a company. So I'll take questions in a little bit. We'll come back to it. Um, so that's, what, that's, what we're, that, that's been the mission of the company. So, and I, I want to say up front that we are by no means a perfect organization. We learn every day as we try to manage these things. And I think I've gotten a little better at managing these five things, but we still as an organization have a long ways to go as a company. But the thing I always come back to the company and talk about is that the important thing is, is that we're thinking about all five of these and we're making strides and efforts in each and every one of them. All right? So what we're going to talk about now is that first key take... Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We're going to talk about our vision. <laughs> hold on, hold on. So talking about just that planet aspiration, here is the vision for that planet aspiration and sustainability. So take a look through this and just read through it real quickly. So this is, you know, we are, we are making good solid progress against each and every one of these. And we'll talk about some of the examples as we go on here today. 
but made with sustainable organic ingredients. We're doing that today. Not all the way where I want to get to, but we're doing it today. Um, bake with clean, renewable energy. We're making some progress on that today, and I'll talk to you about our facility here in a little bit. Um, and then packaging, we've made progress, and transportation that doesn't pollute, we've made some progress in that area too. So we're making progress against all this stuff. And it's important that we continue to do that and lay out goals for ourselves for how we're going to, what we're going to accomplish over the next few years. The first thing I said I wanted you to take away was really to place it into employees' hands. That a, that a sustainability program really needs to be owned by employees and the teams and the people at the company every day. Has to have commitment from the top, but it's got to be owned by the employees. So in 2001, we took on this mountain of debt, and we had these five aspirations. I can tell you at the time, we had, weren't, weren't really clear at all what we had unleashed as an organization. So, you know, we knew that this was the way we wanted to go, but we weren't really sure exactly what it meant to run a five bottom line company. We knew kind of what it meant to run a one bottom line and a natural, in a natural outdoor type company, but not really focused on understanding how five, how it happened. So one of the things that we had to do was figure out exactly what did this mean, particularly as it related to the planet aspiration. So one of the first things we did was we hired an ecologist who's still with the company today, who's our director of, sustain of, of uh, sustainability at the company. And just so 10 years later, she's still with the company doing great work for us. But she had to come in, and we knew we had to put it into employees' hands, but we had to make sure that employees got it at a base level. Because this stuff, any of you um, experts in the area of sustainability or deep dive in it a lot, show of hands, yeah, it can get pretty heady pretty quickly. Like our, our, our ecologist can start blowing over my head in about the fourth word if she really tries. So the importance was putting it into people's hands so they could understand it in a way that made sense. So what we did was we, went out, we, we embarked on a process of really an education and learning. And what that, what that was about was getting external and bringing people into the company as part of it to talk to the organization in, in a real way about it. Some of them were um, on a more base level, and some of them were on a, a very uh, higher inspirational level. We had uh, Al Gore come and talk to us about, uh, was that three to four years ago? Four or five years ago now. Came to speak with us. Michael Pollan, people familiar with Michael Pollan, came and spoke to us. Um, and also we had Ray Anderson. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Ray Anderson with Interface Carpets. Had came, had came and uh, spoke to the company. And what that was about was really exposing the company to all the different types of thinking happening out there on why it was important for us to do this. And with Ray Anderson and Interface Carpet, how it could actually tangibly be done as an organization. We also started a lot of training programs around the company. And this was around one of the project, projects was a natural step, which is a process that takes you through kind of how do you start to work in harmony with nature as a business? And what are some of the challenges and opportunities and what do you need to be looking at to make that happen? So that was a pretty, pretty cool step that, that we took that really got people to understand it at a level that we all could ac access it at. And then we had a group that was called, um, we started to try to make it more tangible for the organization through visual cues or teams. And we had a group called the Eco Posse. So that actually is a volunteer group around the, across the company. And that gives you an idea of when it actually started. Because I think we were actually late in using the word posse, <laughs> even when we initiated it. Because I think that was probably more of a 90s term than it was a, a 2001, 2002 term. But we started to use the uh, word eco-posse. And that was a volunteer group across the company. And what they did was they went around the organization and looked for opportunities for us to make small steps and start for people to get their hands into it and understand what is it about and how do we, how do we each make an impact in our, in our own way. Um, the other thing we did that was a big deal to make it tangible was we started to put things up around the company, things like, um, uh, compost and recycling and paper recycling and made that really visible and started to ask people to do all those things. And here you are, you know, five years later and I've been composting now myself for, for a few years, which is really cool because I learned it something at Cliffborn. I've got my family composting now. Um, and they create, a, they create quite a bit of compost. So it's everybody's, so, so it's a way for us really to not only influence what we're doing at work but also to influence how we're all living at home and everything as well. 
So, you know, the other impact that it has uh, when you put it in employees' hands is you have people, it really starts to provide clarity for you around what people are you hiring that makes sense, right? Because they've got to align for what, you're, for what you're trying to do. They don't have to be uh, environmentalists or community activists, but they have to have a sensitivity and a bent in that area. And it also gave us clarity on who didn't work and didn't fit. So we had people actually start to self-select out of the company and said, you know what, wow, I'm much, it's much more clear and easy for me to work in a one bottom line company than a five bottom line company. And that's okay. And that's okay. And that was, that was, a, uh, that was something that we dealt with and was, was all right. So it gave us really a lot of clarity in that area. But by putting it in people's hands, I'm going to show you some examples. here. So we're going to talk about this right here, that product. So any of you who've done, um, done races, so just remember that product. I'm going to go ahead a few slides um, over there on the left. So one of our guys in R&D, Tom Richardson, this is uh, back probably six, seven years ago, is sitting at his desk. He's in R&D, not, not supply chain or procurement or anything like that, and he's saying, Wow, you know, when I do my triathlons or my running races, the one thing I find all the time, because these products here, this gel, is really a good product for quick energy. So if you're out on a bike ride, you're out on a run, and you need quick energy, it's a quick shot of electrolyte. About 100 calories, good source of carbs, and it'll help you uh, not cramp. So it's a good, a good source of energy and anti-cramping. So you put that, you put that uh, but what happens is that the races, is people in the, on the bike or you're running, they tear off the top and they drop it. So you see these things littered around a race all over the place. So Tom noticed this pain, this problem, for the, a pain really for the planet and for our race directors because they were accountable for cleaning it up. But you're never able to get all those things because sometimes they're sticky and they stay to the ground. So our guy Tom drew up, that's actually the drawing that he drew up and said, you know, what if we put a litter leash? You got your way there. What if we put a litter leash on the product so when you open it, it just hangs there? So we don't have this issue and this problem of it, of it dropping to the ground. And I was like, wow, what a, what a cool idea that came from somebody who was at the ground level dealing with the issue. It wasn't even his function or his area and came up with the idea. Now, that in and of itself isn't going to change the, the planet, but that type of thinking is what we need to embed in organizations across the board, is get everybody thinking about how do we do these things? Because this is how we start to drive real change, because these little steps can become much bigger steps. Second picture there is a lovely picture of shrink wrap. Yes, shrink wrap, which we are out of through redesigning our caddies, so we're not using shrink wrap anymore. We were using a ton of it, and we were, yeah, that's a, it's a pretty cool thing. We were using a lot of it shrink wrapping our caddies, and we just were able to reinforce the caddies and took, um, took a bunch of this out of the system and saved ourselves at the same time about 90,000 bucks. So that was kind of a cool idea. And the last one is, um, came from one of our guys in supply chain looking at our caddies and saying, you know what, I think we could use recycled uh, paperboard for our caddies. So we're now using recycled paperboard for our caddies. And that, even today now, we've moved to using 50% post-consumer as well. So it's a really, um, really cool initiative on our, and that's the caddy, that's the, you guys have seen that before, that's the case that the bars come in. So it's, uh, uh, so these are efforts though, that didn't come from somebody sitting in, the, in, in an office, um, it just came from somebody sitting at the ground level saying, what are the problems and how can I, how can I make it happen? Because these ideas, I can tell you if it were me coming up with these, if I had to, that one there, probably will, I would probably wouldn't be, have thought of that yet today. I'm just, well, that might be a reflection about how good or not so good I am, but I probably wouldn't have thought about that till today. I mean, so it's, so it's, it's embedding it in people's hands is a critical component. All right, so the next one thing I want to talk about is integration into your business. So we've talked about these five bottom lines in our, our business and how it operates. And I'm a firm believer that you have to integrate it into your company, that those five things need to be integrated into how you run your business. You, you hear about a lot of uh, sustainability initiatives that are bolt-ons at companies. Like when I was, I was listening to someone talk from um, um, McDonald's one day, and he was talking about their sustainability department, and they're doing, they're doing fine things in that area. The challenge becomes, if it's not integrated, it doesn't 
the planet, the community, the people, they don't have a seat at the table when decisions are being made. And that's, the, and that's one of the big challenges when you think about driving social change, particularly in using business as a vehicle to do it, is it has to have a seat at the table when you're making those decisions. And it was funny because one of the examples that was brought up was, you know, was a disconnect between what brand wanted to do versus what sustainability wanted to do in these different organizations when it's a built on versus being really fully integrated. So I'm a firm believer on it. Hey, these other companies that do it as a bolt on that are much bigger than us, hey, great, great stuff. You'll make good progress on it. But to really make the traction, to really get going on it, I argue that integrating it fully into your business is the best thing for the planet, the community, people, the brand, and the business. Like I think by doing all five is, is the best way to do it. Um, but you can imagine how, how challenging that is when you start going to a supply chain group and we start to buy organic ingredients and organic, organic supply is short. Because we had to go out and talk to people about changing the way they thought about their jobs. Right, because it's not just easy to say, okay, everybody start thinking about five aspirations. You have to start helping them think through how do we, how do we think differently about our roles. So you think about the sustainable supply chain, where it used to be just about a buy. I want to buy it from you, and you sell it to me. Great quality, obviously, number one. But besides that, much more of a transactional sort of discussion. Today, it's much more collaborative in nature, because we're working closely with farmers. Because we have to, to make sure that we have supply, to make sure that we're doing right by them and they're, they're getting a fair price. And that we're working closely with our constituents in the farming community so they can understand what our growth demands are and needs. So you can see how that, that difference of starting to manage through five bottom lines starts to change how people need to behave. And you obviously, along with that, need to change your metrics and your bonus plan to go along with that. So you're not just saying, I'm paying out only on one thing, EBITDA, but I'm asking you to do all those other things. You've got to drive, drive the connection there to make that happen. You know, in some of the other groups where, you know, on this integration, some of the, some of the other challenges, so we had our HR department, which, you know, had, had primarily um, been about the traditional HR that we talk about. Well, <clears throat> we asked the HR department to come up with some sustainability benefits. Right? So how do we start to fully integrate across our organization when you think about every aspect? So from a human resource perspective, they started to come up with these wonderful ideas. And I'm going to list a few here for you. Um, you know, one is we have a $6,500 um, car allowance for somebody who buys a hybrid biodiesel or electric car. $6,500. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I, I was, you know, and we've, we've had, uh, what's the number now? 40 to 50, yeah. 40 to 50 people actually take advantage of it. We also have um, a solar subsidy, so where we give people a subsidy for their, to um, put solar on their homes. And another is we have a, a pretty cool alter alternative commute program that we offer people um, bike commute, you can get points for alternative ways of getting to work, which you can use for a variety of things of your, of your choice. But it's really cool when you think about um, the program and fully integrating. And I would love to tell you that I had those ideas. I really would. I'd love to sit here and say, you know what, this came from, I was sitting there talking to Michelle and to Rick and said, you know what we need? We need sustainability benefits that really reinforce in there. And these are the programs. It didn't. But when people understand it at a base level, when the teams understand it across the organization, and when you get it's fully integrated and it's expected of them and their bonus is aligned to it, you start to see these types of results. Because these things fit perfectly. I could not have designed them better myself. In fact, they wouldn't have been as good. Because they understood what we were trying to accomplish as an organization. And they were able then to develop a program that fit perfectly and neatly into what we're trying to do and reinforces brilliantly what we're trying to do as a company. So very, very cool things. And it, it really is, as I started and opened up about the integrations, it's to say it, it's got to have a seat at the table. I want to give you a couple of examples of what, of, what that, of what that looked like. Wow. Um, so this is the, the wheel again, 
right? So the tension on the wheel's got to be the same. Give you a couple examples. So that gel product that we talked about, so we, we discontinued a flavor. This is about three years ago. And the team came to me and they said, you know, um, we're going to, uh, and they were thinking about it the right way. They were thinking about the five bottom lines. They said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to, we've got some extra caddies, the package that they come in, and some extra film, the product that it's, that the, uh, that actually holds the, the film holds the product. And said, so, you know what, we want to um, give you a, uh, we want to, we're going to reduce our impact, so we're going to produce the product, ship it out to a big lots. You guys familiar with big lots? Like I said, you know, where, where a lot of times they get, you, uh, in the industry we call it, you flush out your, your older product through there that's getting close to code or, or stuff that's been discontinued. No offense to big lots if they see this, or if anybody in here is big lots. They provide a very, very good function for us all. Um, but you, you, it's, it's about it. So they said, you know what, let's, let's come in and do that. And I said, well, let's sit down and let's really talk about how that supports these bottom lines. Because what we're going to do is produce it, which takes energy. We're going to put it in, a, in packaging and, and materials. And then we're going to ship it to somebody, a customer out there that's going to sell it. I said, OK, so let's just walk through it from a standpoint. So from a business perspective, does it make sense? We don't make a lot of money in that stuff we sell there. So business is kind of neutral. You're kind of just covering costs, maybe. From a brand perspective, did it reinforce as a brand what we were trying to accomplish as an organization? Not really, right? It's going to, it's going to uh, Big Lots. And again, no offense to Big Lots. They're going to make that um, comment every time. But no, I'm kidding. But they have, so there's no, you know, so it's not doing much for the brands. So then I said, well, what about community people? Eh, probably not a huge sway one way or the other. But when you got to the planet side, I asked, like, well, wow, we're going to use energy to produce it. We're going to ship it. Once it gets there, people are going to buy it. And then we don't know what's actually going to happen with the corrugate. Is it going to get recycled? You know, the caddy. What's going to happen with the package? Is it going to end up, where's that going to end up? Right? You know, we end up looking at it holistically and saying, you know what, we think a better solution for this actually is to not produce it. Because when you looked at it from all five bottom lines, it didn't make sense to do it. So we actually took the product, and then we recycled 100% of the corrugate and then had to unfortunately landfill the packaging. But it was an interesting example of kind of live example that wasn't so clear cut when we first looked at it and thought about how do you balance these things to make decisions. Um, and then the other thing is, is ju just the commitment. So a couple of our products, Luna Protein and Builders, which is our, our two protein products, we still haven't, um, we're still working on getting those uh, organic ingredients up over 70%. Today, they range around 30 to 35 to 40 percent. We get, absolutely from a marketing perspective, zero credit for that. And that's OK. Like, I'm not asking for credit for that. But we don't. But it's a commitment to organic, because there's some ingredients there yet we can't get in the quantities that we need from an organic perspective. But it doesn't mean that we just walk away from it, because that wouldn't be living to these five bottom lines and being committed to it. So that is. Uh, and it's interesting because we made, you know, and like I said earlier, we're not a perfect organization. We've made, um, you know, as, as we've managed this and we've learned about this, we're always, we make mistakes all the time on this. I mean, we produced this package one time. It was, a, it was a drink mix called Splashers for kids. And it was actually a really good product. Um, never really got off the ground. At least we thought it was good. Consumers, I'm not sure, ever really knew about it. But it was a, uh, a really good drink product. But the packaging waste in it, because of the way we designed it, just didn't make sense. So we pulled it back in, and actually, for a variety of reasons, ended up discontinuing the product. But we didn't have, at the time, really good way of thinking about how do we, how do we build sustainability into our design process from a packaging standpoint. So we put together a list that said, here are sustainable design packaging guidelines that now the organization for our R&D creative group and our procurement group have as an organization. So we're able to learn from it and then move forward. And like I always say around the company is, mistakes are fine. Let's just try not to make the same mistake twice. Because that means we just weren't paying attention or, or listening and learning from that activity. So the last one I'm going to talk about is, uh, we've got about 10 minutes before I take, uh, take some questions, is, um, is around scaling externally. And I said, you know, you really need to fully engage with your external partners. And that's about listening. It's about learning. Um, and it's about communicating and also influencing those partners as you, as you go on your journey. 
And I'm going to make a few comments in here. And the first one is just, you know, the steps don't need to be massive. Like, you can start with little steps on your journey of sustainability. But they don't have to be all these monstrous steps. If you can take one as a signal, it's a big thing, which I'll talk about here in a minute for us as a company. But little steps can often lead to these much bigger steps as an organization. So, you know, the, we did, uh, the first thing we did in 2003 was we took Cliff organic. So again, remember now, we're, we have this mountain of debt back in 2003 from the, from the no sale in 2001 and the buyout of a partner. And at the time, we commit to going organic on Cliff Bar, which decreased our gross margin by about three to four points. But the commitment was, you know what, we think this is the, we think this is the right thing to do for those five. And also, it's the, uh, we think it's the right thing to do for our consumers and the health of people and the health of the planet. So I made the commitment to it. Um, it turned out to be a great move. Uh, a lot of these other things were, were very small little steps. Like for an example, in 2003, we started offsetting employee commute and our bakery energy. And for, since that time, we've uh, planted 30,000 trees as, a, as an organization. But that led to a really cool program. So our, one of our field marketing people got hold of that in 2004, and we started to sell green tags at all the events we show up at. Right? So we show up at a lot of running events, a lot of cycling events triathlon events, we started to sell those green tags so people could come up and actually offset their travel to that event. So that was a really cool way of starting to hope, hopefully influence, again, uh, consumers in that regard. Another place was um, we did an office green up, as I talked about earlier, about composting and recycling. In 2005, one of our, one of our uh, field marketers took that idea and went out to the Alcatraz Triathlon and created the first carbon neutral triathlon. They had recycling all over the place. They had little compost bins. They offset all of the energy use. So it was a really cool way, again, to touch consumers. And I look at those programs, and I think, you know, who came up with them? It was back to the employees, the people who actually feel and touch it and felt motivated by it. One last example I'll, I'll give you there is that in 2006, we took all of our intercompany vehicles, the ones we drive to the events, and took them to biodiesel. And that led our supply chain logistics person at the time to think, you know what, I bet you if we talk to our partner down there, our th third party logistics partner, they would start to transfer product intercompany on biodiesel. And today they're doing it. So all our intercompany freight is run on biodiesel. And it's a really, but it, was, it started out as a very small step. But then she thought, wow, you know what, I think I can get them to do it. And they now, this third party logistics company, has got solar panels all over the place. They're, they're running biodiesel for all of their customers, or many of their customers now, not just us. And it's really been a neat thing when I think about, wow, we were able to influence you know, a logistics company um, we're making some progress as a, as a, as a, uh, as a people, as a, as, a, uh, as a company. So that was, that was very, uh, very cool. So my main thing there is just, in the, the last one I'll talk about is, so um, we just moved into our new space in Emeryville. Anybody, you know, anybody heard that? We just moved in about a month ago. Um, we are uh, uh, pursuing a LEED Platinum certification. Um, we've got some really cool features in the building uh, today. There's a, uh, we got solar panels up on top that's going to give us 70% of our hot water needs. We got um, photovoltaic uh, solar panels, which is going to be the largest um, in North America um, for, uh, for that today. Biggest, uh, it's going to give us 100% of our electricity needs. Uh, we've got a lot of reclaimed wood in the facility that was used from rail tiles and uh, rail ties and uh, old crates and barns. So really thought about how do we, how do we make that happen from, from the second you open the door till you, till you leave the company and every place that you touch in the company. So really excited about, about that here recently. So taking little steps is one of my messages about external and how you can start to scale from internal to external. The second one that I, I want to talk about and um, will actually be, a, I think, the, 
resonate with you is you've got to scale responsibly. You know, as I opened up and I talked about, you know, organic farmers, is you've got to think about when you scale, is scaling in a responsible way. So we're not, you know, we went out, we took Cliff, 2003 took Cliff Organic to organic ingredients, and then in 2006, I believe, we took Luna Organic. So we staged these things because we didn't want to dominate any one market. I mean, a company like Quaker Oats could come in today and buy up every organic oat in the market if they wanted to. But what, what it, to what end does that, does that solve? That doesn't, at the end of the day, help really um, increase the amount of organic farming that's out there. So we think a lot about that because we didn't want to overwhelm any market. And the, one of the um, really cool things is this is our increasing use of organic ingredients. So we've gone in 2002 or 2001 when we were buying zero organic ingredients to 2009 buying 32 million pounds. So when you think about the amount of pesticides, the amount of petroleum that's taken out, the cleaner water through the runoff, cleaner air, that starts to have a big impact. And in 2010, I actually think we're closing in on almost 40 million pounds of organic ingredients. And overall, when you add all of it up, with the exception of 2010, 150 million pounds of organic. That wouldn't have been had we not, had we not pursued it. And then with, with 2010, we're almost knocking on the door about 200 million pounds since we started the, uh, started the process. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the, the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to open it up for questions for about 20 minutes, and I'll come back and do some closing comments, is scaling. Um, you know, you also got to be thinking about all of this is that you also have to be thinking about scaling your business. That if your business isn't scaling and you're not able to grow and you're not providing products that are hitting the mark with consumers, we're not solving, we're not solving the pain out there. We're not doing anybody any good. So we always like to talk about, you know, this can sound very much like, oh, well, we're just all about four, five bottom lines and, you know, there's a trade-off. But at the end of the day, we've got to make sure it's all working because the way we have the biggest impact is through growth. And when you look at that, that's what's driving that, is our commitment to take more products organic, but also to drive the growth behind each one of those products. So you have to make sure that in each point that you're looking at your total business and scaling it in a way that makes sense for us. Okay? So with that, I am going to stop and field some questions. Yes, here. I'm really fascinated by the litter leash. Uh, I'm wondering, ha have you thought uh, about the metrics there at all about creating a, um, a, a refill jar that would be compatible with the top of the cliff shot and packaging there? So that instead of throwing the whole package out, even though it's got the yeah. you take it home and you, like a push dispenser, you fill your, your, your packet up again. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we had a product um, back in what was it, 2001, or maybe, yeah, 2000, 2001, some, somewhere back then, that was like almost a toothpaste sort of, uh, sort of jar, you know. Uh, yeah, well, no, 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 you'd, you'd take it, and then you'd squeeze it into, because a lot of these races, you have these little, um, these little packs you can have that you can squeeze gel into. The issue is having, having used them in the past, Getting the gel out of there, yeah, you're nodding your head, can be a challenge. So we're still fi trying to figure out exactly what and how that would look like. But yeah, we'd be, we'd be very interested in, in doing that. Because that, that ideally, and then you get rid of the whole package altogether, which is, which is a great idea. Um, so the question was, is there, is there a way to cap the, the uh, executive compensation to, um, to the employee? And then what does that multiple look like? Um, and we are, uh, um, you know, we haven't talked about it, but it isn't like knowing all the acts, having all the numbers in front of me, uh, it's not, uh, we are in very good shape from that standpoint. The, the question is how does, how does a public company actually execute some of these things um, and working with a board of directors who's really focused on, on, on one bottom line, that return, you know, shareholder return. And, you know, we do have an advantage in that area because today we are, um, you know, our, we define shareholder value and our, our owners have defined shareholder value as returning on those five bottom lines. If I came to them and said, hey, I can e increase EBITDA by four points, by the way, we're not going to buy any organic ingredients, that wouldn't work. 
So I, I think the, the, the idea that you, that you have to come back in is look for those synergies because I think it can work in, in most companies. There is a gut check time because in 2001, whether you're at a public company or you're at a private company, when you're, when you got it, when you're facing a mountain of debt and you take on that, that, um, that, that sort of margin hit, it's a gut check time regardless of where you are. So there's always a gut check time in anything that you're doing, whether it's public company or not. But it is a, uh, you know, you really have to think about what are the benefits and how, how do we get people to start thinking differently? Because what I'll tell you on this whole thing when you look back on it, while that first step is pretty hard, this managing a business on five aspirations has actually turned out being extremely positive on that one, meaning the financial. But that first step's a doozy because it's, it's a tough one. But, you know, I, I can, like, it, it's, it's good for business and it's been good for us. And we've been able to outpace both from a margin standpoint over the time and growth standpoint our uh, industry, industry uh, leaders in that area. Yeah? Could you talk a little bit about your marketing strategies? Because not everyone that purchases all of your different segmented products is a marathon runner. So how do you market to your marathoners versus your women versus their kids versus just the snacks? They're not. What? I want names. <laughs> I need names. Now, Great question. So it's really about how do we market and think about going to market differently for different different segments. So you know it's um, you know the, our 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 whole go to market strategy is really based on being with consumers. We do almost almost all grassroots marketing. We don't do a lot of um, do a lot of advertising. We do some here and there spot, but it's very very small. So it's all very much direct one to one. So um, we were at the National Women's Conference this week. We had a booth there where we were talking to, talking to leaders in that in, with our Luna Bar and talking about, you know, talking about the benefits of Luna and organic and the, and the um, makeup of that whole nutrition bar for women. We'll go to um, fairs with, uh, for kids, right? We'll show up at kids' events. Where we're actually talking to moms, giving kids the bar, sampling it. And we do this almost all with our field reps and, 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 and their teams. We deal with that, and we try to always have a Cliff person or a Cliff trained person doing that and handing that product off to them. And then for, for Cliff and a lot of those shop products, a lot of that is, is geared toward that, toward more of that athlete. But understanding that there are healthy snacking opportunities that exist out there all the time and that are uh, big. And then Builder's Bar, you know, our protein bar, we uh, sample at gym. So we're trying to reach people. We call it on the athletic side at the point of sweat where we're trying to reach people there at a race or something to give it. But, um, you know, we had a program called Green Notes a few years ago with Cliff Bar and Mojo Bar where we were showing up at music events and actually sampling there because it was, uh, they were green music events and the, and the performers were, were doing carbon neutral uh, tours. So that was a way for us to connect and reinforce kind of what the brand and the business is about. So it's a very thoughtful, uh, I think, thoughtful plan on how we do it. And... Uh, the crazy thing is, is we, we got this uh, um, Landor, Forbes has, I don't know if anybody saw it, it was about um, Forbes Online, did you see that? About the Breakaway Brands study. Landor, uh, a marketing research and branding company, had done a study based on from 2006 to 2009, what brands had had the greatest growth um, in relevancy with consumers and in... Um, in, in understanding what their needs were on, from a relevancy standpoint, as well as being um, on target and on tune with what was happening in the, in the space. And, you know, so we get this report from Forbes sends it to us, on, or Landor sends it to us, and it shows up on Forbes online. And we're reading it, and Cliff Bar's the, Cliff Bar's the, was number one. I was like, oh, okay, well, let me see who was number two. Number two was? Facebook. <laughs> Number three was, uh, I'm, I'm going to forget them. Anyway, Disney was on there. Kraft Food was on there. iPod was on there. Apple was on there. I'm like, <laughs> huh? You know, how, you know, our size, just our size of business compared to them, let alone our spend versus them. You know, it is, is I mean, if our size is, 50 to 1, and, and, the, and the spend is 200 to 1 or 300 to 1. I mean, 
it's crazy. So we, we really think hard about it and are thoughtful about how we connect um, with people. And uh, you know, that was, that was just a cool, one, 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 one piece of information, but a, a cool result. So the question is, um, Cliff Barr goes back and integrates, you know, back to the, the farm level, but have we thought about influencing policy and, or uh, farm worker rights? And, you know, we are, uh, we are in process of that right now. We've got a, uh, um, actually one of our projects we're just launching is this project called Seed Matters. And it's an organic, um, it's actually an or organic seed initiative that we have that we've, uh, our Cliff Barr Family Foundation has donated $500,000 uh, initial grant to support. And it's really about research. It's about um, protecting farmer, farmer rights to seed because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, con some conflict there about who actually owns the seed, whether a seed's GMO or you know, if there's contamination, who's actually liable for that. So this, this Seed matter, Matters project is one step that we that we've started to take that we're really excited about because it's about putting it putting seed stewardship back into farmers hands so that's been one initiative and we are we are working right now with groups on the on the farm bill and we work through the organic farming research foundation as a group we really support through our uh, one percent through the planet so we donate one percent of net sales to uh, to some various groups that that really help uh, support and design that so yeah thank you for the question um, so the question is, is that uh, just organic education, and the Bay Area is ahead of the, ahead of the curve here, and there are pockets like Boulder, Colorado ahead, and Seattle's ahead, and, but there's many parts of the country that just aren't, aren't out ahead in, uh, in, or understand really what organic is. I think um, that's a big challenge for the industry, and it's something that um, I've had conversations with with industry people about how do we do that. And how do we get, because there are just so many benefits. I mentioned some of them earlier about, you know, to, to people's health, to the planet's health, to wildlife health, to our rivers and streams where you don't have the runoff of toxic pesticides where you end up with miles of just dead river, you know. And, and uh, there's just major benefits to it. And it's, it's, um, it's a challenge that, I, I've, that we've identified in trying to figure out what does that actually look like to solve that and help explain it? Because the interesting thing today is actually that the natural, the natural, you know, on packaging actually has more res resonance with uh, and relevance to consumers today than organic does. And there, you know, organic is tightly managed and natural is just not so tightly managed. <laughs> but it has, so, so there's a big opportunity for us to do that. And, um, you know, what we're doing, we're doing what we can is we're interacting and interfacing with consumers. We're talking about it, and uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of exciting upside. The good news is, though, is organic's been growing at about a compounded 20% plus annual rate for the past, like, five to seven years. So consumers are getting it, just not happening quite at the rate that, that we'd, like to, we'd like to see. So it's something we're working on identifying. You know, so, so two parts to the question. The first question is, how is decision-making actually made throughout the company, right? And then the second part of it is, how does that maybe change as being a, a, an, ESOP, an ESOP company? So um, first off, decision making in the company, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, that, that's always a, it's a really interesting, interesting question because I think it's always a little bit, you can always do better. Like we can always get better at being more clear about how decisions are made. Um, I think for the most part, it's, it's fairly decentralized in the company. I mean, we all know, like you can go, one of the things I think is really cool about the company is you can go and you can say those five aspirations that I showed you, the wheel, everyone in the company can recite that to you. And they can talk at pretty good depth about each one of those five. So there's a pretty good understanding of what those five look like. So what I like to do is, you know, we'll use, a, we'll use, you know, you've heard of the RACI model, who's a responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed on any given decision. We use that kind of loosely, you know, but, but we had this, we had this, uh, this uh, really cool um, video that was done um, that uh, Kate's looking at me like, well, don't, don't give all the secrets away. But we had this very cool video that was done that, um, that somebody in, that's a congratulatory video. So, and it was done by someone in our creative group. They put the whole thing together. It'll be, it'll be 
It'll be used quite a bit. Um, it was checked off on. I never saw it. I didn't see it in my role. Marketing saw it, didn't do much about it, didn't comment much on it. But he kind of took the ball and ran with it. And when people understand it, decision-making process gets a lot easier. <laughs> because what's happening is they're informing me a lot more of what's happening than it is that Kevin has to weigh in on every de single de decision, or our marketing VP has to weigh in, or Gary and Kit need to weigh in on every single decision. But it, it varies depending also on, on what that decision is. So, Now, ESOP, I actually don't, I, you know, I, I had the same question myself. I thought, how's this going to work when we're, when we're an ESOP company, you know, 20%? And, you know, it's, um, it's very much the same. I mean, control hasn't changed. Gary and Kit own 80% of the company, so control hasn't changed. And decision-making, really, in the process of it, hasn't changed. Because um, people get where we're going, and they understand the importance of, um, of how, we, how, how, we, how we need to make decisions and move fast, and that everybody's not going to get to weigh in on every decision. So you know, what, I, what I hope to do today with you was, um, was, one, was just introduce you a little bit more, since most of you know Cliff Bar and Company, introduce you a little more about the Cliff Bar story on how we came to be, as well as what, our, um, what, we've, what we've done on our sustainability journey. Um, also is open a dialogue and hopefully maybe inspire some of you in your, your current roles or open a dialogue about how can you do this in your own companies or how can you accelerate what you're doing in your own companies or how can you help Cliff Bar think differently about what we're doing to help us get better, because we're always very open to that. And then lastly, wanted to provide you with some tangible lessons. So when I think about scaling internally, it's about you know, putting it in employees' hands and integrating it as a part of your business. And then when we talk externally, it's really about the little steps and the big steps, you know, that you can just start taking little steps and they'll move into big steps. It's about, sustain it's about scaling responsibly, about understanding the larger, larger marketplace that you're in, and then lastly, it's about scaling your business as well and making sure that your business is growing and that you're doing the right thing for, for consumers. So, and then, uh, you know, lastly is that that five, that five bottom lines, this guy right here has really been a driver for us around the integration and, and understanding what we've, what we've been able to accomplish. But, you know, it, it, this is my, my challenge to you guys is at the end of the day, we all have a role. We've got big challenges out there, and business is a vehicle for us to to address those social challenges and driving social change. And we all have a role in doing that. You know, I am, uh, you know, we're, we're, at, we're at the, you know, here we are at the, the best schools in the, in the, in the country. And we are the, we are the leaders and we're the future leaders of, uh, of business. So it's upon us to take on this challenge and to make it happen. Um, you know, my, my hope, my hope, and I, I, uh, and I mean this, is that this isn't a differentiator for Cliff Bar in the future. It just as becomes the way business is done. And that we're talking about the merits of our, we'll, we'll, we'll go on the merits of our food, and we'll go on the merits of our, of our quality and the value that we create. Um, but my hope is that, that this doesn't become a differentiator, that everyone is running their business based on triple or five bottom lines. So what I ask you guys is that, you know, get out there and figure out what is it that I'm doing day in and day out that helps us drive the type of social change that we need to drive as a people. I'll be swinging this, I'll be going after this thing for the next 15 to 20 years, and long after that, 15 to 20 is hopefully just with what, with what I'm working, um, but I'll be going long after that on keeping the fire burning on, on, on this type of stuff and reducing our impacts and uh, driving business in a different way because business needs to play a role in this area, and you all need to play a role in this area. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.